uh, for him. But I also want to just recognize that his wife is here with us, Sister McDonald. So thank you for joining us today and supporting your husband. You can give him the critiques afterwards. You know, the, uh, but Andy, would you like to come up and introduce Jason? Sure. Oh, if so. Sorry. I am in a different world. <laughs> Jess. Yeah. Okay. So we have a couple of things to announce. We have only one, the well, very last week of seminar didn't have anybody signed up for soup or dessert or rolls. So I forgot to write the URL up. But go to bit.ly forward slash ipsa soup. <coughs> I'll go get, I forgot the sheet. I'll go okay. get it and we'll pass it around. Yeah, we'll just pass around the sheet. Never mind. Don't go to the website. We'll pass around the sheet. Um, then we, don't forget about the women, ladies, don't forget about the women's lunch tomorrow at the MOA at noon. And it's just kind of a get together, chat, get to know each other a little bit more. Um, then next week, Thursday, April 2nd, from 7 to 9, at my house, we'll be wa having another movie night. We're going to be watching the documentary, Objectified. We'll have the usual chips and queso and pizza, so you're, everybody's welcome to come. Take of that. And then on Saturday, April 18th, from 5 to 8, we're going to have Peter's This Is Not Your Normal Spring Swing Fling Thing. <laughs> and it's going to be great. We're going to have Nacho Supreme. So everyone's gonna. If you'll sign up, Rob's gonna send out an email. Well, you can sign up to take, bring like olives and cheese, you know, whatever it is that you want to bring to the Nacho Supreme. Bacon. We'll provide the chips. Somebody bring bacon. Somebody can bring. You can bring bacon if you want. Oh, not. Ben's called the bacon. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is that? Uh, April 18th from five to eight. So we'll be watching for an email from Rob on that, and then let's see. Yeah, then um, last week we had another dinner with the designer, and Ben is going to give a little report about that experience. Um, so we went to dinner at the Thai Evergreen with Stephanie and David Egbert, who formerly was Stephanie Allen of this department. Scott was there, Becca was there, Sabrina was there, and Janelle was there, and we had a great time. We got to... Um, Tell them about ourselves. They told us all about their stories, how they came into the field, and what they what they've done in their lives, and what they're doing at the church now. So we got to learn a lot about them and kind of see what it's like on the inside. So that was really cool. Okay. okay. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce to you uh, Jason McDonald. He is an alum of uh, BYU's IPP program, 2006. He did one of the most interesting dissertations I think I've seen, and, uh, and he did it on technology one, two, and three. And if you want to go find out what that's about, go read his dissertation, which is fascinating. Uh, it's about how you hold an idea once you get an idea. And he did a wonderful job on that. Uh, Jason has been affiliated with the Motion Picture Studio as its director at one point. He's currently uh, the director of digital products for Deseret Book Company. So anything that has a digit in it, that falls under his beta. <laughs> and I think he's going to tell us a little bit about what his recent experiences and thoughts have been. Jason? Thank you. I'm glad to have you here. Thank you. Actually, I actually have a few things I want to start with. First, if you're interested in uh, what happens at Deseret Book, I'm happy to share some of that with you towards the end of the presentation. But I'd like to start first uh, with a proposition. For this group in particular, I'm sure it's not a surprise that LDS educators for a very, very long time have been trying to come up with what we would consider a gospel-centered theory of learning. And my proposition for you this afternoon, that is if you want to find these practical teaching techniques or even universal principles of learning, I will suggest to you that the scriptures is not the source to which you want to turn. At least not the way we commonly use the scriptures in such an enterprise. Just to give you a flavor of what I'm talking about, let me share with you a couple of examples as we get started. And these are all from, uh, from different teaching guides or uh, LDS-oriented educational guides. First, what do you notice about the Savior's way of teaching? He asked questions that caused students to think and feel deeply. He was sincerely interested in their answers and rejoiced in their expressions of faith. He gave them opportunities to ask their own questions and share their own insights. Clearly, the Savior's way of teaching is different from the world's way. 
Second example, the Savior used memory questions, reasoning questions, and questions from the heart. We can use them also. And then the final example, the Savior is the master teacher, and he uses divine methods and purposes to teach the definitive course. In his instruction, the Lord exemplified several approaches that we should consider in our teaching responsibilities, such as preparing meaningful messages, bearing testimony, and applying the message to the learner. Now, these examples and many others I could share, they commonly suffer from one of two problems. The first is they tend to really not be that helpful when you really look at it. They're vague or fairly obvious. But the second problem, if they are more specific, is often you find that they're really just current educational trends or fashions kind of dressed up in the language of the scriptures. So my concern in both cases is that, is that these really don't represent unique gospel-based learning insights, insights that no one else in the world could come up with because no one else in the world understands the truths that we understand. Now, in saying this, I don't want to suggest these are bad ideas. None of the things I shared are, are terrible ideas by any means. But despite at least one of them claiming to be different from something they called the world's way, there's nothing terribly uniquely LDS about them. And I think we need to ask ourselves the question that if we were to develop this definitive gospel-centered theory of learning, would it consist primarily of ideas that you can find practically in any school or department's, uh, department of education? And what's more, I think it's sometimes even questionable that many of the educational suggestions offered in these kinds of guides are even found consistently in the scriptures as much as we sometimes would like to see that they are. Just a couple of examples keying off of the things I shared a minute ago. At least as I see in the scriptures, Jesus sometimes asked questions to stop or shut down a discussion as much as he did to start a discussion. And I'm not aware of any instance where he actually prepared a lesson, let alone prepared that lesson in advance. In embracing ideas and examples like these as scriptural, I'm afraid that sometimes we fall into a form of subjective validation. And what I mean by this is we accept these ideas as gospel-centered, not because they really are, but because they already hold personal meaning or significance to us. In essence, we say to ourselves, well, if this is important, of course it's going to be in the scripture somewhere. Now, just to examine the issue a little further, if the scriptures were a source that we should turn to for this kind of specific educational advice, a few things probably ought to be true, especially if we were going to use the Savior as a model. The first is we would have to assume that the scriptures are actually a complete record of his life. But if we take that he had a three-year ministry and we know a 33-year life beyond that, how likely is it really that the few dozen chapters of the Gospels, many of which we know overlap and duplicate significantly, how likely is it that that really represents a complete record of what the Savior did? Isn't it at least possible that some of the most powerful ways he taught aren't in the scriptures at all? Because those who wrote the Gospels were more interested in recording the content of what he said rather than the way he conveyed it to the people around him. I think we also need to remember that those writing the scriptures, they were shepherds, they were farmers, they were tent makers, and they were poets. And so even if ancient people taught using our modern methods, how likely is it that these scriptural authors noticed what they were doing, then thought those techniques were important enough to record, and then had the precise language to describe it in ways that we, we today would understand? And even if that's true, all of that is true, What's the chances that even if some of those techniques are there, that in other cases that we're imposing our modern biases back into the text? I think it's fair to say, we find in the scriptures often, that there are very, very difficult passages translated from dead languages written in ancient genres that reflect extinct cultures. And that's a very, very difficult thing to apply to modern circumstances. Now, even on top of all of this, I think the whole exercise of using the scriptures in this way, it assumes there really is 
if there is an identifiable set of divinely approved learning principles, the way we typically go about it kind of assumes, I think, that God cares about these things, but for some reason doesn't care about them enough to tell us explicitly. He kind of hides them in a code that can only be deciphered by experts who learned about them through other means. And I think that's questionable. But other than not being very intellectually rigorous, using the scriptures this way to guide our learning theories might not be that much of a problem, uh, except for a few other assumptions that we tend to bring to the situation. The first assumption is we tend in our culture to assume that the scriptures are authoritative, and we should. They are authoritative. But when we apply them in this way, we can pacify ourselves into thinking that we already know everything there is to know about learning, and so don't go through the intellectual exercise of trying to dig deeper into the sources that we should in order to understand the enterprise a little bit more. I think there's plenty of evidence to show that God wants us to be creative on our own. He wants us to develop things unknown in this world and not just regurgitate the things that have happened again and again and again. Another problem is that these can be a diversion. And I mean that in the sense of a diversion. It can be a diversion to play intellectual trivia games with the scriptures. We map instructional design textbooks to the scriptures like it's a giant puzzle. We believe that because we're working hard, we actually make progress. And in truth, we're just dressing conventional wisdom up in scriptural language, continuing to recycle the same methodologies we've always tried. Now, even on top of all of this, another problem is we threaten to canonize more than what's nothing, what's nothing more than current practice. We risk remaining loyal to out-of-date ideas long past the point that we should jettison them because we feel like giving them up is abandoning our faith when really we're just retiring the old jersey. When I was a student here, I found a lot of historical examples invoking the Savior's blessing on teaching techniques that today are considered backwards and sometimes uh, even harmful. A lot of my research as a student focused on the, uh, the technique of programmed instruction and teaching machines. So for those of you who aren't familiar with this, programmed instruction is a method of giving students very, very small questions with very, very simple answers, leading them through step by step to, to some culmination, some culminating answer. And today we often find this a little condescending to students and sometimes even harmful because it focuses so clearly on basic recall. Yet about 40 years ago, an LDS educator said this, employing programmed instruction is a practice that emulates the methods of Jesus Christ. Where would we be today if yesterday's LDS educators took their theories as seriously as their evangelizing suggested? Now, at least to me, after all of this, the most troubling outcome to, to using the scriptures for such specific educational purposes is that we can bind other people to our personal preferences by expressing these things in such strict statements of orthodoxy. I'm also afraid that sometimes we can insinuate that those who deviate from our preferences are disloyal to the gospel cause, when really all they're doing is trying something a little different. But do any of us really want to try something new if the answer we get is, well, if the way we're doing it right now is good enough for Jesus, why isn't it good enough for you? <laughs> and you think I'm making that up, but let me just share something, uh, that a similar statement from a former professor at this university. In recent years, we have heard a lot about being facilitators or discussion leaders. This method has its place, but it's no substitute for teaching. It's not the way Christ taught. It's not the way Joseph Smith taught. It is not the way anyone of whom we read in the scriptures taught. Now, is there a better way, just one final example, is there a better way to invoke heaven's blessing on an insignificant and personal topic than to authoritatively state without any evidence at all that the Lord did not make idle chit-chat in teaching? Now, I've come down pretty hard on this to make kind of the point, but even with all of this, of course, we need to believe that we can be inspired by the Holy Ghost in every circumstance of our life. Of course, we should turn to the scriptures for inspiration on anything important to us. I'm just saying, let's not treat that as more than what it already is. Yes, let's express beautiful ideas in the beautiful language of the scriptures, but let's do so without giving them the authority of scripture. 
And yes, let's seek the inspiration of the Holy Ghost on any topic that we care about. But when we receive personal inspiration, let's be careful not to think that inspiration is a reflection of the order of heaven. When the scriptures state their purpose and objectives, they don't say anything about giving us instructional methodologies or even universal principles of learning, so why would we insist on using them for something they don't claim to be? Do you have a question? Yeah, I'm just wondering if you shared these thoughts with the uh, Come Follow Me curriculum people. <laughs> and if so, how have you it? Let's talk about that in a couple of minutes. <laughs> uh, I want to get to the exercise here in just a couple of minutes. Um, now, because saying, after saying all of this, I don't think that the exercise is completely futile. I don't think that using the gospel and the scriptures to improve our craft is a misguided effort, but I think we need to think about it in a different way. Uh, we should just not expect to develop uniquely gospel-centered educational insights by searching the scriptures for specific advice. I believe the real work is to develop a strong understanding of the themes of the gospel that recur again and again and again. The things that truly are unique, themes like repentance and atonement and sacrifice and redemption, faith and covenant and love and service. Once we understand these things deeply and build on that foundation, we should examine our best educational ideas in light of these themes. And if we do, I think the edifice we build of learning theory might look quite different than what we're doing right now. Really, to summarize, I think we need to worry less about what the gospel says about learning and instruction and pay more attention to what the gospel says about the gospel and then use that to inform every aspect of our life. So I do want to, before I come to some specific questions like you asked, I want to talk about and speculate what this might look like, give you some practical meat on the bones, if you will, of, of what this could be. And I want to do this by uh, just throwing up on the screen some typical passages of scripture. Even though I'm isolating these verses in, in just the context of the presentation, I hope you'll feel, I think you'll see that they are representative of what we find, um, the themes that we find often in the gospel and the scriptures. I think some of these things are likely to make us uncomfortable. And I want to talk a little bit as we go along about why that also is. And I really want to do this in the spirit of experimentation and speculation. I don't want to worry so much whether what we're doing is orthodox or authoritative. I'm sure it's not. I just want to push some of these scriptures and scriptural ideas as far as we can go and see what happens. Fair enough? I need you to talk or this is going to be a very short presentation. Okay. I will talk. <laughs> Here's the first one. And the people began to be distinguished by ranks according to their riches and their chances for learning. Yea, some were ignorant because of their poverty, and others did receive great learning because of their riches. So what would an implication of this passage or many, many other passages be if we wanted to develop a gospel, a true gospel-centered theory of learning and instruction? Yes, sir. I think first we need to know the context. In the context of the scripture, these ideas presented are not good ideas. Okay. So this is not the idea we should be shooting for is what you should say? Okay. Fair enough. Good. We should establish a class society. <laughs> <laughs> Others. Just don't be shy. Yeah. It seems that there needs to be more equity across the board of what type of education people receive. And that can be maybe helpful or not. Okay. Thank you. Other ideas? Yes. Well, we don't base a learning theory at all, and this is just a historical statement. Okay. <laughs> with pedagogy. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you're saying it doesn't matter whether we... Yeah, not this version. This is not helpful for learning. Okay. Maybe as a counterexample, right? Maybe as something we want to avoid. Okay. Peter? Uh, oh, okay. Go ahead. Well, it's interesting because it says they're ignorant because of their poverty, not because they didn't get adequate instruction or because they didn't have these things, and so maybe... A primary concern of educating people should be alleviating their poverty. Okay. Not just techniques that we might do in the classroom, but making sure they come fed and with secure housing and adequate clothing. Very interesting. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Good. Anything else? Yes. Um, I don't remember where this quote comes from. I think it's the prophet, but he says. The world would take the people out of the slums, mm -hmm. but the Lord takes the slums out of the people, and they take themselves out of the slums. And I think an implication for this is that teaching the gospel will improve education. Okay. In the back. 
This first teaches me that there's a relationship between wealth and chances for learning. I think that's valuable. Okay. Last comment here. I think it's interesting where it, it, there's two there's two words and there's two ver there's two um, dimensions of learning. One is the chances for learning, and one is great learning or the I don't know if it's quality or quantity. Okay. It seems like those could be two different. Dimensions. Okay, Dr. Williams. It yes. Like it's commenting on the, the problems with their political system and their culture, and so I think it's saying that we want to explore how to help people learn. Yeah. So be a little broader in what we say. Don't just focus on one idea called education, but look kind of it in the context of the whole. Is that kind of what you mean? All right, let's hear one more and then. Um, as well, in both cases, it uses the word some, which to me says that there are very much exceptions to the rule, and one thing is going to work for everybody. Thank you. Now let's just bring it down a little bit closer to practicality as well or not, maybe not so much practicality, but actionability. We know that there probably are some really legitimate questions or issues if we were to try to extend educational opportunities to everybody. We know particularly people in deep poverty, they have a lot of issue with uh, not having potentially learned a great work ethic in their home. Uh, they might have a, a lot of learned helplessness or other things that make it really challenging. And I think we need to recognize it. It is really challenging to extend opportunities to everybody. But that's only true because that's the way it is right now. It's not true because of the way it has to be. It's true because that's kind of what we've decided as a society that is what we want. And because we're very smart people and very creative people, we can change that if we want. So here are some dissertation ideas for you. What do you do? I mean, how do you practically mitigate some of these real challenges in educating people in poverty? How do you improve people's ability to uh, progress quickly so that they can accelerate and catch up to those who had great chances of learning their entire life? Those are real issues that need to be addressed. We can't just look at the scripture and say, let's change these things. Let's get some great dissertations out of this department and other departments with great LDS students to address these things and see if we can't change kind of the tenor and, and make a difference in some of these things. All right, next one. Behold, he who has repented of his sins, the same is forgiven, and I, the Lord, remember them no more. This is certainly a gospel theme, isn't it? Does it have any implication for learning over here? Oh, Andy, go ahead. Does it mean that then if I got when I was an undergraduate at Arizona State can be erased? That's exactly what I want you to take away. Yeah, good. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, it's the same it's kind of an evaluation assessment kind of thing. You know, does your GPA follow you for the rest of your life based on these things? And your, your sins always are staining you. Okay. <laughs> Good. There's another hand over here somewhere, I think. Maybe not. Yes. I think that re repentance also applies a change, like a part in behavior as well. So as you change your behavior or you learn something new and change the pattern of the habit you've been having, like the, that that new habit or the the new way of learning something has is now the habit or the good thing that you have. I don't know. That's okay. Thank you. Yes. I think we need to understand repentance a lot more before we try to apply this somewhere, because <clears throat> repentance is more than just things being like bad effects of previous decisions being taken away and it's more than just seeing the world in a new way uh, there are a lot of a lot of things about repentance that we don't thoroughly understand and i think i'm okay. going to apply this to me too thank you it changes the way that we look at grades as far as not just what we get but how we grade in the classroom and the assessments we're trying to provide yeah so some other dissertation ideas. If a student really wants to change, how do you help them leave their past behind? That might be in the spirit of this, wouldn't it? If a poor performing student really wants to change, how do you keep them from being tainted by the records of their past that we have kept pretty darn good records of historically and probably will do even more so in the future? Another implication is that uh, if a person can be forgiven and uh, uh, their bad performance in the past Perhaps we need a system of grading where a person doesn't get uh, on a curve with other people. 
on a curve where if everybody in the class is really smart, this guy slides down to be the failure just because there had to be a certain percentage of failures. Yeah. I hope the Lord doesn't grade on a curve because I'm probably in a lot of trouble compared to some of the people that I associate with daily. I, I mean, I hope, I think I'm doing pretty well, but I know I'm not doing as well as some people are. <coughs> so thank you. Any other comments on this one? Anyone feeling uncomfortable about some of the things we're talking about yet or any of these implications? Well, great. Maybe we'll get there soon. We've learned by sad experience that it is the nature and disposition of almost all men, as soon as they get a little authority, as they suppose, they will immediately begin to exercise unrighteous dominion. Does this have anything to say to teachers? <laughs> we should have women teachers. There we go. Because it's just men. Good. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Peter. Okay, so this is uh, definitely an interesting scripture, obviously not one that I th see normally applied to teaching situations, right? But the relationship between authority and responsibility is discussed in, in this section. And um, I think one of the things that this portion of DNC is trying to point out is that um, people think that because they have authority, they get to exercise dominion but it expresses the relationship between authority and responsibility. If you understand that you have authority so that you can fulfill that responsibility, then that changes the nature and the way that you approach things. Good, right? And so yeah. I think if we look at this as, as uh, teachers, right? If we're given authority as teachers or as administrators or in whatever capacity we're given, we understand that we're given that authority so because we have responsibility to fulfill the responsibility of helping others to learn. I think that's important. Right? And that can help us understand that if they're not learning, we're not using, we may not be using our authority in the right, to, we're not fulfilling that responsibility. Does that make sense? It does, thank you. Yeah, right here. I think um, along with that, just like also the importance of teaching like soft skills to people and like Good. helping them understand. Because, I mean, if we're teaching children, they're eventually going to be faced with this, or they already are, and so you can't, and it's it's like the natural man, it's going to happen, and so it's not just teaching content, but teaching the character. Uh, how about for instructional designers developing online courses? Does this have anything to say to you? Yes, sir. I think it, um, what it says to me is that we need to make sure we understand our students or our audience very well. We may come in with all these theories, with all this learning that we've gained, and we will start to apply it. And we don't really care about the results. We just like, this is going to work. And if we don't take the time to, to, to understand who is going to be receiving this, to find ways to make sure that the learning outcomes, the goals, what we want to achieve, is actually happening, then we will be failing. We will just be relying on our laurels. Okay. Thank you. Just a hand somewhere over here, I think. Maybe not. Would you like to say anything? Go ahead, Jay. Um, yeah, just along with that, I, I think uh, we focus a lot on the learner, but I've also been working in corporate training for the last couple of years, and the client's concerns become a big deal. And definitely you want to serve the client's needs, but I also think there's a role in considering other stakeholders and helping the client um, better serve their learners. I, and I think here at, at, in the program, it's easy to focus on the learners, but once you get into practice, you have these clients that tend to dominate the discussion. So not losing focus on the learners. I've developed a lot of online courses, and it is easy, trust me, as an expert having done this many, many, many times, it is easy to apply control techniques because it's fast, and it's efficient, and it's cheap. What's a control technique? Uh, forcing the learner down one path regardless of what their personal goals might be for the course. Yes? Kind of on another thought of that, uh, from that. It, I think it suggests that we should have a healthy dose of intellectual humility. Um, people tend to think of gaining authority as a sign of success, so what you are doing is obviously the right answer. Um, 
but perhaps more than ever when you get an authority, you should be questioning uh, yourself and looking for better uh, and best things rather than getting comfortable with what you did before. Great, thank you. Let's move on just because uh, I got a lot of these and <laughs> I'm having fun, I hope you are. He said unto them, render therefore unto Caesar the things which be Caesar's and unto God the things which be God's. Does this have anything to say? Let's just maybe take one or two comments Wait, on this one. Are supposed to integrate gospel into everything? Sometimes <laughs> we can just render unto them what we need to. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Anything else? Accreditation is a necessary evil. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so this next one, I'll throw it up here, but I'll give a little background on it. So this is out of the parable. You remember the parable of, of the landowner who went out and he got a bunch of servants to work for him at the beginning of the day and he promised them a penny if they worked all day and he gets them a few hours later and he gets them a few hours later and he gets them one hour before closing time and then he goes to pay them and he starts with those who started last, right? So these last have wrought but one hour and the master paid them a penny. So the people standing back in line who'd worked all day say, well, I'm going to clean up because these people worked an hour and they got a penny and I worked 12 hours, so wow, what am I going to get? See, these last have what wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal with us. So remember, these people who, got, who worked all day, they got to the front of the line, and they also got a penny. The same as the people who only worked an hour. Thou hast made them equal with us, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. What well, this might this... So this can be really... In the gospel, this can be a hard concept to come to, and I think this is a hard concept to bring to your teaching because you have students, and you have uh, some students who try really hard the whole time, and some students who just try really hard at the end, um, and some students who just want to get a C. And it's hard to, to I, I guess, know how to do what Christ would do in that kind of a situation. Thank you. Um, it's, it speaks to me about teamwork and seeing yourself as a member of a group instead of as an individual. Last week I read an article about transformational leadership versus transactional leadership, where group members unite around a team um, identity as opposed to their relationship with the leader. I think uh, as we think of ourselves as a member of a group, we become more effective, more, more. Uh, we create better results um, at the end of the day. Thank you. Let's go to, uh, let's go to this one. This will be fun. If you are not equal in earthly things, you cannot be equal in obtaining heavenly things. This is certainly a prominent theme in the doctrine of covenants, especially. Does this have anything to say to education? Yes. I went to a presentation, maybe some of you guys did too, just last week, the guy over the education system in Finland came to speak here. And as we hear a lot, they're supposedly high up on the PISA scores. And he talked a lot about, he had this graph up between equity and um, oh, just quality of education. And he said that in order to get a really good education, you have to first focus on equity. Maybe that's coming from different political views as well. But he said something similar to that. Okay, thank you. What else? Yes, sir. I think we, um, we need to teach students how to counsel together when they're working on a group project or pretty much any time when somebody's working in a team, uh, they need to be able to counsel together in a way that everybody is equal because that's the only way that the, the most productivity and enlightenment can happen. Thank you. I think just understanding that like all these students come from really different backgrounds too, some of them you know, live in the country for a year or something like that. And so no, no one's going to be earth equal in possessions or in mastery of the language or social skills or anything like that. And so as a teacher, you have to, I mean, you need to compensate for those, those, and not just treat everyone like 
they're the, they're at the exact same level. Good, thank you. Andy? Isn't he talking here about the, the attitude of the people that he's talking to? He said, if, you, if you're not equal in earthly things, if you can't stand being equal, then you're not going to be able to be equal in obtaining heavenly things because they're going to become people who are hired in the 12th hour of the day and they're going to get the same reward as you. And if you can't handle that, then you're not going to be able to handle heavenly things. Yeah. So another possible idea. You know, often when, when political systems apply ideas like these, it's a race to the bottom, right? But what kind of systems would encourage a race to the top? That if we took seriously giving everyone equal opportunities and even leading to equal outcomes, how can we create systems that encourage us all to rise to the level of heavenly things instead of all of us sinking to the most mediocre outcome that we could imagine? Or how can we create people who are willing not to look at their learning as a, a striving for supremacy, but look at their learning as an opportunity to help other people up. Good, yeah, very good, very good. Okay. <laughs> Say nothing but repentance unto this generation. Good curriculum. <laughs> <laughs> yes? I've always viewed repentance as the doctrine of progression, um, and that it can be used in any sense, uh, anywhere. Um, I can use it in my learning, I can use it in my um, getting faster at typing on a keyboard. I mean, the, the principles of repentance is, yeah. Anyways, but I think in the same way, in teaching, um, that's what teaching's all about, is progression. And so if we talk to people about progressing and turning away from what they were when they very first entered into the classroom, whatever environment that's in, then that's fulfilling the goal of teaching. You're good. Dr. Williams, yes. Maybe a shorter way to say the same thing is say nothing but evaluation of these. <laughs> thanks, thanks for never changing, Dr. Williams. <laughs> Last one, will you still persist in setting your hearts upon the vain things of the world? Yes. I think this ties with the, the last one in that what, we need to be careful that what we're teaching or what we're designing to be taught is the best possible version of the thing that could be taught. That we're not just teaching the popular theories, but that we're evaluating them carefully to see if they really are progression. Thank you. Very similar. Uh, I was seeing from a learner's perspective that we don't allow uh, main things that may just be time suckers to invest all of our life into and then realize we have nothing to really show or gain from it. Last comment here. Um, I also think that sometimes we, I've been talking about coding schools a lot lately and thinking about those, and, and I'm, I'm actually a fan of them, but just that we, we attract students to these programs because we offer them really competitive jobs, and sometimes we risk not educating the whole person and seeing how that job has context in society, so we're just pointing towards that you know, get the most bang for your buck, but... Good. Uh, Rick, okay, I'll give you the last one. Too, I think in general, every time they talk about uh, reform in education, it's usually about quicker ways to getting careers. And while that can be valuable, I think that does kind of do that a little bit, where we maybe neglect some of the traditional role that education universities have played in, in educating the citizens of societies and things like that. Very good. Well, so what? Um, let me maybe say just one thing about so what in a very narrow, just taking a really narrow example. Perhaps you've read this from the book of Numbers. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Or as the same things expressed in probably my favorite translation of the Old Testament, may the Lord bless you and guard you. May the Lord light up his face to you and grant grace to you. May the Lord lift up his face to you and give you peace. The statement is used in many, many branches of Christianity for a, a, kind of a lot of different purposes. You can imagine a pastor or someone coming to a hospital where a child has just been born and quoting this verse to the parents. And the parents will feel something and they'll probably learn something. 
Or if that child passes on, the pastor might quote the same verse and the parents will still feel something and they'll still learn something, although it'll be very different. Or perhaps that child grows up. Perhaps that child is LDS and goes on a mission. This verse could be quoted at that, that missionary's farewell and people will feel something and learn something. Could be quoted at the homecoming and they'll still feel something and learn something. This person lives a long and prosperous life and when they pass on in the ripe age of 92 years old at their funeral, this verse could be quoted and people will feel something and they'll learn something. All from just a few little words here in the book of Numbers in the Old Testament written thousands of years ago. The person who wrote this wasn't applying a technique. The person who wrote this wasn't crafting something according to a set of rules, I assume. I think that's probably a safe assumption to say. They weren't following a set of rules. They weren't applying a formula. They weren't plug and playing uh, concepts into a, a template to make something that was so clear it could not be misunderstood. As I look at my, the rest of my career going forward, I want to do more of this. And I want to do less of those precise statements that can't be misunderstood those very technical things that may have uh, an impact and a meaning in a very, very narrow parameter, but 20 minutes later they're gone. And they don't change people. And they don't help people. I want to be more like the guy who wrote the book of Numbers and less like the guy I've sometimes been in the things I've written in the past. I guess I'm saying I want to repent. And my invitation is that you join me in this. Let's become these kind of people Let's worry a little bit less about the precise and specific educational advice, regardless of its source, until it's time to apply those things. Let's make our business becoming these kind of people first, and then the techniques we find, regardless of their source, whether they're from the scriptures, whether they're from the back of a newspaper, whether they're from the back of a matchbook, will truly reflect the gospel at that point. Remember, it's not so much what do the scriptures say about the, the teaching and learning, it's what do the scriptures say about the gospel. And if we make that our meat and drink and become these kind of people, then I think the whole enterprise changes, regardless of what theories we espouse, regardless of what philosophical orientations we bring to the table, we'll be the kind of people the Lord needs us to be in order to develop the kind of outcomes that he wants us to develop. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Jason. We have maybe a couple minutes for questions, if you have questions. Let's do it. Yes. I worked at church headquarters for about seven or eight years. I worked actually very closely with the Come Follow Me um, team. Um, did I share with them this presentation? Of course not. You know, this has just been developed over the last few weeks. But are these the ideas that I've been thinking about and care about for some time? Yeah. Uh, how do they receive these things? Uh, I think that they're actually quite enthused about these kinds of things. Uh, they see their job as a, as, a, as a process. You know, we can't eat the elephant all at once. And so very intentionally what we see in Come Follow Me today is the first step of what they hope is a multi-year process in order to really uh, develop what they would consider, you know, a Lord, the Lord's uh, ideal educational system, if I could use those terms. They probably wouldn't use those terms, but I, I just did on their behalf. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. Your question probably really also has something to do with how practical are these things? Are these really things that you can act on? And I guess part of my answer to that, too, is they're practical if we think they are. They're practical if we think they should be. Yes. Oh, over here. Oh, okay. Can you... Can you go back to the scriptures you skipped? I want to see those. Oh, okay. Let's see. This, this was probably the first one I skipped. The last one you did was these of about one hour. Yeah, though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and have no knowledge, though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth, and so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. And, okay, there may have been one more. Let me just go back and see. 
No, I think that was probably it. Okay. Um, I believe you had um, background with the Bible videos. Could you uh -huh. speak to that a little bit and kind of what, why that came about or thoughts about it? Sure. Um, yeah, so the Bible videos project, uh, it, however many years ago it started, was an initiative from the first presidency because it was kind of noticed that there were very, very few scenes of the Savior that could be used in, in church media, whether it be a, a, you know, another video like a Mormon message or in a classroom or uh, you know, any setting that the church wanted to show life of the Savior. There was actually, as we looked at the gospel, there was maybe a, a dozen passages across the four gospels that we had usable media in still. So it was an initiative to create high quality media for the gospels in the book of Acts that would cover as many of those stories as possible that could be a library for 15 or 20 years for the church to continue to illustrate those important teachings out of the life of Jesus Christ. Last one, and then... Uh, which translation of the Bible was, was that last? The last one, that's uh, Robert Alter. So he's a, he's a professor of, of literature, a Hebrew poet, and has translated probably about half of the Old Testament in a very poetic way. Do you think that there might be better understanding of the Bible in the church if more people read various translations? I'm on camera, so I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh, right. Andy. So okay. Let's, let's uh, give Jason a hand. And we would like to invite Jason and Jennifer to come down and have soup kitchen with us if, Thank you, you. if you'd like to and we'll have more time for informal questions there. Thank you. So thank you, Jason. Yeah, oh yeah. Let's see, who can I get to take them down? Scott, I will take something. Follow me. You guys, <laughs> you guys have permission to go right to 